Well, hello and welcome to another lesson of ANP with Dr. H. And today we're just going to try to finish off some cardiophysiology by summarizing the controls of cardiac output. And of course, for this particular lecture, you're going to need to have gone through some of the previous materials. But maybe not. Maybe you're just here for a quick review of all of the controls of cardiac output, and that is perfectly fine. So let's start this thing off by saying, what do we know about cardiac output? Cardiac output, basically the function of the heart, right? This is the total amount of blood that's flowing out of the heart over time. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of start to write out a, a flow chart here. And we're going to say at the top of the flow chart, we have ourselves cardiac output. And what do we know cardiac output is equal to? We know that there are two variables that control cardiac output. Right? That first variable that controls cardiac output is heart rate. And the second variable that controls cardiac output is stroke volume. So we're going to add them into our flow chart. We're going to kind of do them separately here. We're going to say heart rate and we're just going to go ahead and start abbreviating this. And over here, we're going to go ahead and have stroke volume. So what do we know about cardiac output? Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume, the two variables that control it. Cool. Awesome. This is awesome. So now what do we know about heart rate? And what do we know about stroke volume? Were there anything that we learned that controls heart rate and stroke volume, and I hope you guys are already asking or uh, basically telling yourself, well, yeah, we learn that we can increase the heart rate and we learn that we can decrease the heart rate and that anything that increases the heart rate is called a positive chronotrope and anything that decreases the heart rate is called a negative chronotrope. Whereas over here with stroke volume, this is the volume of blood ejected in a single contraction of the heart. We call these inotropes, positive and negative inotropes. So what sort of negative chronotropes did we learn about that the body actually has? The body, what sort of acute response can the body take? If we need to decrease cardiac output for some reason, how is the body going to do this? Well, there's only one way that we learn, one normal healthy way that we learned that can decrease the heart rate. And that is the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So we know that the parasympathetic nervous system affects that heart rate. What about a positive chronotrope? What are some positive chronotropes that we learned about? Well, in the human body, there's really not a lot in terms of normal, healthy, acute. How can we change it right now? There are a few more that we can do over the long run. But in terms of positive chronotropes, really, it's just the sympathetic nervous system, both norepinephrine and epinephrine, that are going to be acting on that. So let's go ahead and draw those guys in. So we're going to say norepinephrine, epinephrine. Actually, let's go ahead and be smart here. Let me write over the top of that. We're going to say sympathetic nervous system, just the entire sympathetic nervous system. And then down below, what we'll do is we'll say, Hey, well, what do we know about the parasympathetic nervous system? And what do we know about the sympathetic nervous system? How do they act on heart rate? Well, parasympathetic nervous system is going to act by releasing acetylcholine. And the acetylcholine is going to act on muscarinic receptors. So let's just add that to this. We don't want to put too much information on our flow chart. We want just enough to be able to go and have a memory of the rest of the material. And then you'll have to go in and talk about what are muscarinic receptors, how do they affect the heart rate, right? We got GPCRs that are going to hyperpolarize the cell and slow down the depolarization rate. But that's for another study. Right now we're just trying to get a summary, right? What do we know about the sympathetic nervous system is that we're gonna have norepinephrine or epinephrine. Don't forget that norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter, whereas both norepinephrine and epinephrine can act as neurohormones. But they are going to go to the heart and to the autorhythmic cells, 
and they're going to act on beta-1 adrenergic receptors, right? So up here, when we're talking about heart rate, what we're talking about is autorhythmic cells. If you've seen my previous videos, you know that I talk about this a lot. So that's what we know affects the heart rate acutely in the human body, normal, healthy. What about stroke volume? Well, let's go ahead and write this out first. What do we know about stroke volume is that it's being controlled by myocardial cells. All right, cool. Can we increase stroke volume? Well, we certainly can. Can we do that right now? Sure can. If we're running for Mr. Axeman, we want that heart to beat stronger. So what's going to happen? This exact same pathway, the sympathetic nervous system is going to have a positive inotropic effect on that stroke volume. Pretty cool little summary of the controls of the cardiac output. And how does the sympathetic nervous system have an effect on myocardial cells? Well, sympathetic nervous system acts by releasing norepinephrine or epinephrine, acts on beta-1 adrenergic receptors, and beta-1 adrenergic receptors in both the autorhythmic and myocardial cells, those are going to act through hey, that other GPCR, right? Where now we're going to have, for the heart rate, we're going to have an increase in depolarization because we're increasing the rate that calcium and sodium enter that cell. And over here, we're going to have phosphorylation events via cyclic AMP, same thing that works over here with the heart rate. And that cyclic AMP is going to act on phospholambin. So there's all sorts of things that are found in the previous videos. And you could fill those into your flowchart. But again, you don't want too much in that flowchart. You want just enough to be able to try to decipher it later. There are some other variables that can increase stroke volume. What do we know about stroke volume? Ah, oh, that's why I had the black pen. What do we know about stroke volume is that stroke volume has an equation that goes with it, right? Stroke volume now is controlled by two variables, EDV and ESV, and diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Both of those control the stroke volume. So let's go ahead and draw some arrows up here. We know that stroke volume is EDV minus ESV. So both end diastolic volume and end systolic volume will have an impact on stroke volume. EDV, what would happen if EDV increases well, since that's the primary variable that controls stroke volume, right? As EDV increases, stroke volume would increase. And as EDV decreases, stroke volume would decrease. What about in systolic volume? There's a minus sign here. We need to remember that this is the volume of blood in the heart at the end of systole. So if ESV decreases, that means that there's less blood left in the heart at the end of that heartbeat. Right? So if EDV remains constant, but ESV decreases, well, that tells you that heart just beats stronger, so more blood left. So stroke volume increases. In other words, the negative sign here, if we decrease a negative, it increases. So it's a nice little addition to this story. And we're going to focus a little bit on EDV here because the body has a nice little acute response on EDV that we should think about. So if you increase end diastolic volume, you increase stroke volume, but how can we increase end diastolic volume? Remember, yet again, end diastolic volume is just the volume of blood at the end of diastole. So let's just increase the amount of blood that returns to the heart. Okay, this is called venous return. otherwise often known as preload. Right? Venous return slash preload. Venous return, the amount of blood returning 
to the atria, either from a pulmonary circuit or from the systemic circuit, it doesn't really matter. But if we return more blood to the right atrium, there's going to be more blood available for the pulmonary circuit eventually, and therefore more blood going to the left atrium. It all kind of ties together. How can we get more blood back to the heart? Well, let's remember the anatomy of that system, right? The anatomy of blood return to the heart all has to do with those vena cava. And vena cava returns blood to the heart. So from the vena cava, blood flows to the heart, right? To the right side of the heart, to be more specific, or right to the right atrium. So if we took blood from the vena cava and put it into the right atrium, doesn't it stand to reason there'd be more blood inside that right atrium? And that's absolutely the case. The vena cava is actually a reservoir of blood. The entire venous system is a reservoir of blood. Goodness. Do I even know how to spell reservoir? I don't know. That is a great question. But we're going to go ahead and go with it. It's a reservoir of blood. And the vena cava has big longitudinal muscles that run the length of that tube. And so if we are able to stimulate those muscles, then the length of the tube is going to get shorter. And blood can't go backwards through the venous system because of valves. So there's only one place for that blood to go. Again, if we stimulate the vena cava and it shortens, blood has to go back to the heart. So what's going to happen to the venous return? It's going to increase. What's going to happen to the EDV if more blood goes into it? Well, at the end of diastole, there's more blood. And as EDV increases, then stroke volume would increase. How can we get that vena cava to contract? Well, for those that have already studied this fantastic, it's the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system sends innervations to the vena cava. And on that vena cava, well, there are alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, well, really just norepinephrine, it's going to have the biggest impact, is going to go and have an impact on alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. And when those alpha-1 adrenergic receptors are excited, the vena cava will contract. And as that vena cava gets stimulated, more blood returns to the heart and that increases stroke volume. So this is a great little summary of the controls of cardiac output. Honestly, we can work through this, this particular flow chart with almost any variable, almost any disease. Let's think about, for instance, what would happen in a patient that started to have heart failure, where their heart, and we're, we're gonna go with like left ventricular diastolic heart failure, okay? When their heart's just not beating as strong, so now what starts to happen is the stroke volume decreases. Well, since cardiac outputs equal the heart rate times stroke volume, as the stroke volume decreases, cardiac output starts to decrease. Cool. Awesome. What about EDV? What if we had less blood returned to the heart? Then EDV starts to drop, stroke volume starts to drop. What happens to that patient's cardiac output? It decreases. So how can we start getting less venous return? Well, what if a patient uh, has hypo hypovolemia? What if they have low blood volume? Less blood's returning to the heart, therefore that heart beats weaker in each subsequent contraction. Less blood leaves the heart, so there's less blood available to go to the brain and to the tissues. What about a positive chronotrope? What if we enhanced beta-1 adrenergic receptors? What if we had an increase in the number of, of beta-1 adrenergic receptors on both autorhythmic cells and myocardial cells? Well, cardiac output's going to increase, right? 
We're going to see tachycardia in our patients. We're going to in see increases in the strength at that heartbeats. So what sort of things can cause beta-1 adrenergic receptors to increase or upregulate? Well, what about hyperthyroidism? What if there's an increase in T3 and T4, an abnormal increase in T3, T4? That's right. Now somebody's going to have tachycardia and an increase in stroke volume. Cardiac output's going to go through the roof. Well, dangerously so, potentially. Um, gosh, all sorts of other things. What about caffeine? Caffeine enhances cyclic AMP. The more cyclic AMP in the system, now we're going past this point, right? Past this point. Now we're looking at cyclic AMP. So with caffeine, what are we doing? We're enhancing the speed that that heart is beating and the strength that that heart is beating. It's a stimulant. What about atropine? Atropine is a muscarinic receptor blocker. So where would that fit into here? Well, muscarinic receptors are nowhere over here in the myocardial cells. They're not impacting the sympathetic nervous system at all. The only thing that muscarinic receptors are involved in is decreasing that heart rate. So now what if we throw in atropine and that blocks, okay, flat line blocking, that blocks the muscarinic receptor. So now parasympathetic nervous system can no longer decrease the heart rate. So what's going to happen in a patient that gets atropine? their heart rate is going to increase. We're inhibiting the inhibitor. So I hope you guys can start to see that this summary of the controls of cardiac output, it actually can look at almost every single disorder of the heart that affects cardiac output. Now, that being said, of course, it doesn't talk about all the different types of infarcts and murmurs and all that sort of stuff, but each one of those sorts of diseases will impact some level of this cardiac output summary of controls and you guys will be able to go through that at a later date. All right, that's all I'm going to do for the summary of the controls of cardiac output. As you go through all of my previous videos, you'll see that um, I talk about this in detail, right? Like for instance, when I talked about the intrinsic and extrinsic controls of myocardial cells, I said if I want to increase stroke volume, everything that I'm going to do through the sympathetic pathway is going to try to enhance calcium inside of that cell, right? So when we're going this route, when we're going this route over here, if we increase the calcium inside of this cell, then we know we're going to increase the force of the next contraction. So force of contraction is always proportional to the calcium found inside of these myocardial cells. So those sorts of things are really helpful little um, uh, formulas and ideas that will help you understand how cardiac output works. Well, I hope you do find this video helpful. I did it relatively rapidly for me. <laughs> um, please ask questions down below, leave a comment. Um, appreciate your time. And I, again, I hope I helped. See you in the next video. Humankind be both.